Hey everyone, this is Bartley and Patch talking about Tactics Ogre. We're in a real, real heartbreaking moment. Cutscene thing. Spoiled the emotion. <laughs> if you're following on from the last episode, Gatua just busted away from Leonar and the Duke. The Duke who kind of was pretending to care about her and then just said he only needs her so that we would stay in line. And this is her reflecting. You remember she was um, offended that uh, Abuna Prancet isn't our father? And so she's like, Brother Butley, you're the only person. <sighs> she's always been alone. So, Patch, who is the familiar voice? I don't know, I'm interested. I think I pause on this for like a whole minute to give you a, ch a, a chance to brainstorm. Uh, Nybeth, Knights of the Lotus, the Duke, Leonor, Gildas. What's your, no, re what's your real answer? away! Oh, you're the crow guy. No, he's on the other side of the world, though. Um, Zapan, Nongpa. Didn't Zapan die? Didn't Vice did. kill him? Yeah. Oh, Vice! Oh! Oh, no. Have I spoiled it? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> if it's Vice now, I'm gonna laugh. It would be a very <laughs> Vice thing to say. No, you have always been alone. Brother Butley never liked you. And me neither. <laughs> you It'll got be, in the way of um, our bromance. It'll be... Oh, who is it? Who's the guy that's been with us since the start? With uh, the wings. <laughs> Canopus. Canopus. I don't He's going to push her in and like laugh. He <laughs> push her in. Boop. Tonberry shows up. Ha, ah, Final Fantasy jokes. Who's there? Who the hell is that? What? Oh, uh, is it a Lotus Knight? Yes. What? It is... Lancelot Tartaros. Oh, it's the other Lancelot. The evil one. Whatever happened to the good one? You got, well, we're not sure. He was defending Rhyme. Remember when Gildas got shot with the poison yeah. dart and Meriden got away and came to join us? He was in that fight, so we don't actually know. Probably dead. I have this no sound in the game at the moment. <laughs> it is like full silence. Stupid sprite. His eye patches on the wrong side. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's hilarious, hey. It so puts you out <laughs> of it. It's so bad. Such a horrible mistake. <laughs> Sorry to anyone who was really hoping for a dramatic scene. Um, since there's so little sound in the game right now, mute us. <laughs> yeah, try and actually <laughs> just, enjoy just the moment. Sound. Your father followed her only a few months before the war broke out. Dun, 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 dun. This is the war, I think, that united all the realms. We're like the next war when they all broke apart. You are alone, truly. Dun, dun, dun. I have a brother. <laughs> It'd be funny he does it, he's like, oh yeah, I forgot about that guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh damn shit, it. sorry, I'll leave you alone. Oh, yeah, don't worry about it. Exposition is not cool. My bad. You realize the Abuna was not your father. <gasps> She's like, so far you have not told me anything I don't already know. Just get with the killing me already. He's not gonna kill her, he's recruiting her. You assumed He's using the recruit skill, I can see it. The recruit skill. He's gonna run out of um SP soon. He's got um recruit skill whiny sister. <laughs> You assumed wrongly. <gasps> How good is that? Ominous he thunder. Knows, <laughs> he knows lightning magic as well. <laughs> run, Kachuo, run. Then who am I? Who do you say I am? That's You're actually... the daughter of Nybeth. The other daughter. The other, other, other daughter. Vesalia. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's uh, Nybeth's name. <laughs> You're ruining the moment to all the clued on mm. listeners. <laughs> Oberith! Which one is Oberith again? Um, do you remember the king that united the lands? <laughs> is he the one that got beheaded? No, no, no. Okay, thank god. The king, there's a king, Oberith who united yep. the lands, 
And then when then he, died, he died, that's when the three factions split and had a war over succession. So Basically, I need you to validate my claim on the throne. The Marry me. <laughs> yeah, and you're, you're getting it. I've played and seen enough <laughs> fantasy games to know when this is a ploy. And it's a pretty good ploy, because he would, if he can prove legitimately that she's the daughter of the king, that would give them the biggest claim to the throne. Um, and people loyal to the old king would rally behind her, which families did. And you need to understand the... Oh, she's a bastard. Yes. But it wouldn't matter, because she's not... She's still the king's daughter. Yeah. Which would make her the only living heir. Manaflora. Yeah, so you, I don't know if I put enough emphasis on this the whole time. All the Dark Knights of Lotus have been talking about this whole time, this whole journey has been Manaflora. And they've been a prince that mentioned it, and we were like, who the hell is Manaflora? What the hell is Manaflora? We didn't know if it was a thing or a person or an item or what. Man, who cast Quickened on the wound? But, you, but you can, so you can see what sort of happens. So to elaborate on the story, there was a prince, like baby being born. So it wasn't that big a deal. Like Manafora died. Yeah. So it was just like we'll just cast Cat Catcher away. It won't matter because the prince will take over. So it's not, you know, we didn't have to kill Catcher or anything like dr dramatic like that. And then all was good. Let's face it, kings were hardly the most, uh, self-controlled. <laughs> Bastards happened. Well, I'm, I think what happened is the queen was probably a marriage of, uh, sealing the houses and helping unite the world. So it wasn't a, yeah. a marriage of, of romance or love or whatever. And if you remember the three guys who rose to power, there was the... The guy who claimed blood, which I believe was Balbatos, there was the Duke who's the Wallister Rebellion, who we're with, Duke Brownie, and then there was the Regent Bryant Moore, he's the backroom guy, and he was the Regent who manipulated his power of the church. And so this is what he's saying is that Branton, um, he used his, like, knowledge of Manaflora to, like, bribe people to, to get to where he is. Neat. So, with that unbeknownst to Kachua, she's been pretty heavily responsible for the shape of the land, and all the war and everything going on has had a lot to do with her. <laughs> and so... No pressures or anything, Kachua. Well, this is funny. It's, like... It's really deep, because she's the one who has been flat out opposed to war. Like, she's been getting more and more fed up with the war. That's why there was a divide between her and, and us as Butley. And these... You might remember that we both have a necklace. In our, actually, in our equipment. Like, I've been wearing, I think it's the Azua necklace the whole time, and she's had one the whole time. So it is actually an item that she's had, which is kind of cool. I don't think you can take it off, her, actually. I'm pretty sure I can take mine off. <gasps> there you go. Nice. So she's always kind of had that. She didn't really understand. Here there is. King Dorgalua of Barath. <laughs> I can never remember. I love a name. name. Yeah. I actually wonder if it means something, in like Japanese or something. Who knows? Like the dragon or some shit like that. <laughs> you know, like that's the sort of thing you'd expect yeah. in a fantasy game. It's funny because he thought, they told him that Kachua was dead. And she wasn't. There's so many implications to the wider story once you know this. Like, you look at it and you go, Ah, oh, yep. 
it's a it's a fairly common fantasy trope, but in the context of this story, like the implications are still huge on so many levels. Yeah. I want your skin. So a boona prance it. <laughs> Butler's Going dad, a, a boona prance it. <laughs> yeah, I want your skin. Dun, 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 I'll be dun. the prettiest princess. I like this. He's like, I want you to return with us, and then his guards come out. But he's gonna reunite her with the Boona Prancer. But you can sort of get where he's coming from because she's gonna be like, Why did you lie to me? And it's gonna divide her and the Abuna even more. So she's full on princess. Pretty much just one inauguration away from being queen, I think. Although who would recognize that at this point, I don't know. Pretty deep and serious stuff. Cause let's talk about the the Knights of Lotus. So we know that Lotus are sworn enemies of Valeria. Right? Okay. Yeah. No, we don't know that. Who is it the Who are the White Knights? Crikey, what are they called? Anyway. The point is there's a fight between Lotus and you know whoever Canopus' friends are I forget their their name now you know the Holy Knight Lancelot yeah wherever they're from whatever that place is called I forget so there's a fight on that island so if you're like the Knight's Lotus and you come to Valeria which is our island I believe as opposed to theirs Just seeing if there's anything here that's interesting. The point is, like, they come, they capture the princess, they get some kind of support from the land of Valeria to help them in their fight against the White Knights and whatever their place is. It's really annoying me that I can't remember their, their little part <laughs> of the, the land or the continent or the team. That's annoying. But yeah, it's pretty, pretty serious for, for her. Yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Her current whereabouts are not known. So they left. Even though we kind of know they went to Heim, we don't know exactly where they're going from there. Dun, dun, dun. So now we know who Manaflora is after all this time. Yay! So anyway, you can see why the Lotus came. You can see why um, them and the Regent of Bakram sort of took up a deal because the Regent needed someone to someone not from Valeria to go and get Catua back. Because yeah. if he'd have told the Duke or the other guy that she was the princess, well then they never would have let her go. I don't. I don't think the Duke even knew. I think the Duke purely saw her as a way to string us. Butley home because we were like his star mercenaries <laughs> um, and we already busted away from him once and um, but the Lotus are then saying well we can use that or the alliance with Backroom or just any influence on Valeria to help win our war as well so it's kind of sinister and that's the queen the, son the prince died that's why this all became relevant like if the prince had lived no drama but he died yeah. and died in an accident too. I don't think it then ever goes died. to explain if it was a legit accident, accident or not. Uh, and he's Gildas, rest in peace. <laughs> Poor Gildas. We tried to save him and then he died, but at least we set his soul free. Every shit, shit time. Also. You may... Uh, am I spoiling? I don't think I'm spoiling, but you'll notice at this point that the White Knights... Remember when the first episode, when we first meet Lancelot and his crew, and they said they'd been cast out by their leadership? Yep. And they were mercenaries? 
Well, you're probably noticing by now that that's not true. They were sent, like, as a counter to stopping the lo night Dark Knights of Lotus. <laughs> like, it was all a... It may be that gets revealed later, it might have spoiled it for some people, but you can probably tell. Like, they deliberately picked a team that wasn't the backroom to fight with, and they deliberately got themselves set up in a place where they would end up fighting the Dark Knights. Like, they've been trying to stop them the whole way. You'll notice they came straight to Goliath. They probably knew about the princess from day one. Yeah. Because that they came to go. Why would they be in Goya? There was nothing where we are. We were, you know. But they came straight to us. So there's a good chance they knew about her already. And meeting her and us in episode one was actually them, like, already knowing about the plot. I wonder if we will ever defeat Nebeth Obdelord. I mean, if he can just go in co-form every time he gets low on health. <laughs> it's a pretty cool ability. I wonder how we learned the co-form ability. We don't. We get to turn into, like, a fish or something. Frog. Yeah, I was thinking frog, but... <laughs> frog song. It's another Final Fantasy reference. Whoops. She has a long name. She was slain by the resistance. Who else is on this list? Ah, Moldova was the first one we fought, I believe, a while ago. She was part of the sisterhood. I think if you take a different route... No, actually, I won't say that in case it still happens. <laughs> <laughs> there are other things. Unfortunately, yeah, my knowledge of this game isn't properly, <clears throat> excuse me, as proficient as it should have been when doing a, like a <laughs> let's play, but we're not really let's playing, we're just ginning through the map. Shooting through, shooting the breeze. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a phrase that I've, I've been using a lot. I like it. It's, it's very representative of what we're trying to do here. Um, I don't think we actually do anything too much interesting. We're gonna look at some lore. I think we go do some crafting after this, or just shopping in general. Um, so we might go back to talking about what we were talking about before. And to kick it off, we sort of got to a... Well, in my head, we were talking about um, the, the amount of time it takes. Like, should you know a game is good? And I don't want to get hung up on, say, four hours. I wonder if the point here is like what's an appropriate amount of time to learn how a game is going to be and my question to start this off would be should it be reflective on how long the game is as a whole so in I don't know Half-Life, how long's Half-Life? Like you get like 15, 20 hours out of Half-Life? I, I honestly wouldn't be able to tell you without going into the game and okay. looking at saves or... Halo 4 is 10 hours at best if you're playing mm. on high difficulty and you have a bit of trouble. I probably did it with that's, eight. That, yeah, that's probably generous. So, if you don't know everything that, yeah, you know, if you haven't had some good indication of how that's going to be in the first, like, you wouldn't give that game four hours to decide if you think it's going to get better. Right? Probably not. You probably I mean, the first four hours are pretty boring of that game, so. Right, right, but I just mean like, yeah, you're, you're gonna know what you're in for well within four hours. Or yeah. you would have made up your mind within four hours at least. I don't remember why we have a spiked shield plus one. I'm like, why don't I, why don't I just use it then? It's amazing. Maybe you stole it from someone. I probably, no, I think you've got to craft all your plus one items. I might have done right. it for that Dark Knights fight, and then it might have had like a level 14 um, level restriction on it. Anyway, I give it to Falkert, I'm pretty sure, because he doesn't have any healing magic, whereas Voltaire can heal himself, so... You know, I'm gonna make Falkert, like, super massive tanky damage juggernaut, and <laughs> Voltaire's gonna sort of go into a bit of divine magic and stuff like that. So I'm trying to, you know, make both of our leading knights a sort of a little bit different, you know what I mean? Like, Falkert will keep getting stronger armor, whereas Voltaire might keep some of the bolder armor, because it's magic armor and stuff. 
Yeah. Let's try to make them both unique and different so that depending on the situation we can call them up. Um, and that's why I don't mind having a Dragoon and a Death Knight and things like that because yeah, op like for an optimization perspective you probably always sort of pick certain ones but in the sense of just trying to pick a team that might be fun for the particular missions that we need them for I'll try and rotate and do different things. For now, I'm just trying to make sure that everyone has sort of the best gear they can at this point in time. I think we're going to um, go and raise some of our lower classes again. I think. I'm not sure if I do another story mission or not. I think we get waylaid on the way back home, but that might not be this episode. Anyway. You've been waylaid and must defend yourself. <laughs> yep, I like that saying. You must gather your party before venturing forth. Yep. Ah, uh, there... Baldur's Gate. Here's the thing, right? In this game, you learn in the first few battles how the game will play. And from there, all you get is more classes, more abilities, more variety in fights. I don't know, I feel like I'm going in circles with that argument. The, the thing is, I don't believe a game should have to wait a certain amount of time to show you what its full extent is. I feel like there should be some way to show a player what they should experience in advance and i don't mean and i hate this intro the intro where you give a player everything and you throw them into a big fighting area where you're overpowered as hell because you've got everything <laughs> a lot and assassin's then, creed the original yeah and then they take it away from you and yeah. you start off with scrap and i think that's the worst kind of intro i think it should be you get within the first four hours of a game you should experience at most 30 minutes of like cutscenes and things maybe an hour tops and the rest should just be like an example of the gameplay it should be primarily showing you you know this is what you need to do to play for the rest of the game and it doesn't have to be to a great extent but it would be showing things like the combat you're going to expect some of the things you can do, some you know, some of the ways to improve the combat over time, the crafting, your recruiting, um, different weapons, different things, adjusting your party, all that sort of stuff should be taught in those first four hours in how pretty about, much any game. How about we go I'm trying to think of something we haven't mentioned yet, one game that does it right and one game that doesn't do it right. Okay. I don't have one. I'm just brainstorming. What, a game that does it right in what way? Like well, exactly what you're saying. So, a game that introduces its concepts and its core gameplay and the idea of what things you might have in store in, a, in the right way. And a game that gives you a period of time, maybe two hours, maybe four hours, where you probably don't get an indication of what the game's going to be like and therefore it doesn't like you, it's, it's in a bad way. It doesn't uh, represent the experience you're gonna have, or you won't be able to judge the experience you're about to have. Basically, any game um, that you think starts good and gets gets worse as you go on, that'd be a prime example. A game that starts good and gets worse. Well, well I would say Borderlands starts... Two is great at yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, what, another example. Like we've talked about Borderlands, talked about Mass Effect, Halo, you know, whatever, Half Life. What else can we talk about? Something not. I don't know. Um, this, the problem is, when a game starts to get worse, I stop playing. <laughs> and, and, uh, I don't know, what I guess... About I couldn't... Like, Minecraft I'd say is a good example, because it basically well, gives you the notion that you will be sort of free to do anything, and it gives you an idea of, you know, you're going to be collecting things, you're going to be using your creativity to build things, and sort of free license and it's a good one because it gives you all that experience pretty much straight off the bat well you know what i was going to say for a good one sure. and this might be cheating because the game is so short regardless but undertale undertale um throughout the entire game and i know some people give shit for this because they don't like undertale people for are going to judge you based on whether they like undertale regardless yeah. of what your point is <laughs> that's just how it goes Here's the thing, the game introduces you a base concept. It introduces it to you in the first minute of the game. You are in combat in a little box. Things will fly at you, white things. Don't touch them, they will hurt you. That is introduced at the very first 
state of the game. Now, in the first hour of the game, you'll likely finally encounter the Skeleton Brothers um, and fight the Skeleton Boss fight, the Papyrus Boss fight, in which you are taught, um, leading up to him, not to move when a blue object is coming at you. And a blue object will pass through you as long as you're not moving. And Papyrus's gimmick is he has this special blue attack. And what he does is he turns you blue. And then you are suddenly affected by gravity. Instead of being able to move in four degree, you know, four directions, you, you have to now jump yep. like it's a platformer. And that has introduced you a base concept, made the base concept different and more interesting in some way, specifically the don't move when blue, like when targeted by a blue thing. And then it trips you up and violates that same concept by reintroducing a different idea. Technically, you're still obeying the first principle, which is don't get hit by white things. But now you have to do it in a new way. And all throughout the game of Undertale, it's like that. It keeps introducing these new concepts. You get green, which you should touch, orange that doesn't hurt you when you're moving, and it goes on and on. And each time there's something else that comes along that's like, here, mix it up a bit. This is and that's a perfect example. <laughs> Too many things in my head in one go and I wouldn't manage very well. <laughs> But that's a, that is a prime example of a game that it lives off keeping it fresh. And if Undertale was twice as long and had the same amount of gameplay changes, it wouldn't be half as good. Even if it kept up the quality, the quality of its writing and, and kept a variety of enemies, the fact that the mechanics wouldn't change as much would be enough to make the game less interesting. And that's something you can also be said about, and here's a good example, Portal 1 and 2. Portal 1 is such a precise and concise game. It introduces concepts, lets you play them out for maybe one or two levels, and then it moves on to the next concept. And it keeps going and going and going with this until the ending. Um, Portal 2, it, it almost feels like the creators loved their game too much, in that when they introduced a concept, there would be this large talking thing about it. There'd be a voiceover of an NPC talking about what the thing was, what it did, and some adverse effect, and there'd always be a joke. And then after that, you know, you, you do the level, and you apply the knowledge you've gained of this object into the level, and you do that for like three or four times for each thing. And each time it'd be, here's the concept, here's the concept plus something, here's the concept plus another thing you've learned before. And it sounds like the great building blocks, but it just keeps going on and on. And the game, too doesn't much have posturing, not enough actual meat. I, I think the word is brevity. It, it goes on instead of being concise. It should be brief but informative instead of rambling. Mm. And that's it, it's you know, Portal 2 is still a good game, but it loves itself. It, it really wants you to, ex to use these mechanics and figure out its puzzles, and it wants you to stop playing the game so you can listen to its voiceovers. And sometimes it will actually stop you from progressing so you can listen to these. And sometimes if you just go ahead and listen and, you know, do the levels without listening, you miss all their jerks. And it, it sort of messes with the speed of the game and the flow. Right. And when it's the like voiceovers aren't matching what's going on on the screen anymore. And... Yeah. And yeah. compared to Portal 1, where it was, you might get like a short introduction to the level. But typically after the, you know, tutorial levels, it, it just lets you go. It's like, here's a level. Go. And it's up to you to figure it out. And since you're in an enclosed room, you can always hear the voice, even if it talks a bit, and you're just meant to, you know, play the level. And Portal 2 doesn't do that as well. It, it introduces things, and when they're introduced, it does them too slowly. The game just overstays its welcome. It has to keep inventing these new big groundbreaking twists to sort of add variety, but that doesn't add um, quality. It, it just changes things. And all it does is add a length to the game that wasn't needed. And you know what? These complaints, these criticisms can be leveled at many of the games that I have complimented. Halo, yeah, no especially game is, Halo 2. No, no game is perfect. I think well, no game is without criticism. I understand that. I mean, Half-Life, uh, that game can be, like, the vehicle sections I've heard a lot of people criticize because they go a bit long. Um, and things like that. Like, I can totally understand if people have those complaints about games I've said positive things about. But 
the point is, you introduce a concept and you allow a person to use it. And you allow them to use it creatively over the course of a game, providing new and new experiences. And you can't have a game that goes too long and keeps someone interested in the gameplay. Is what I believe. Well, I don't have anything extra to add. Definitely not yeah, something that Yeah, I just sort of rambled. Be... No, you're <laughs> right. I'm not, I, I ramble plenty of times. It's it's interesting. Like, not everything has to be my opinion, so... It's good to have a perspective. That's why we do these chats. I mean... Yeah. It's not... And again, and this is what I mean. The discussion wasn't hinged around Mass Effect either. I was just... The concept of... How long do you have to hook your audience versus... You know, when are you doing right by your audience and when are you not? If modern game developers be believed, you have to hook your audience in the first half an hour or they won't stick around. And I am more forgiving. I will usually put an hour, almost two hours into a game before I, I really go, no, this is too much. But that's only the amount of time I put into a movie but or again, some I, other I mean, medium. I guess that's my point, though. I still think that how long you would bother would depend on the total time that the game has. I don't know. Like, you can't say, oh, I need to put in... I don't know. Like, if you're talking about something like an RPG, you need to give it a little bit of time. Whereas if you're talking about something like, I don't know, say, Papers, Please, you need to, you know, you're going to know in 10 minutes if you like that or not. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I'll try and try and put down this final statement really quick. Yeah, um, sure. And that is, um, a game developer who makes a good game should be able to still give you a full experience within a smaller frame of time that allows you to extrapolate and, and enjoy what you're going to enjoy later. Whereas a bad developer will just add padding. <laughs> Alright, well that's our closing note. Um, this is our little closing warning that I put in <laughs> when I go to the save <laughs> section. Um, thanks everyone for watching. Hope you found that interesting. I did. That's pretty cool. I enjoyed talking about that. And I'll catch you next time. Bye.